Hello and welcome everyone. It is good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from this, uh, this morning or afternoon here in Singapore. So um, thank you once again for making the time to attend this uh, webinar. Today we are going to be talking about um, a few different API styles that you might be familiar with if, you are in, if you've been in this space for a little while. Uh, things that you might have heard, things that you that might concern you directly or maybe indirectly, maybe you're considering certain adoptions, maybe you're in, already in the middle of something. And we'll try and address some of those concerns and hopefully showcase something very interesting uh, in terms of managing those APIs in perhaps a little bit better and more efficient way. So let's begin. Without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, and also for those familiar, unfamiliar with, uh, with, with Zoom, uh, if you do have any questions at any point of time, do feel free to post them. There is a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to use that. The topic for today, managing SOAP REST and GraphQL APIs with Tykes Universal Data Graph. What we're gonna be talking, the key points for today will be a quick introduction into the different API styles, um, SOAP, REST and GraphQL. Again, some of you might be familiar with them, some of you may not be. Um, and then we're going to be talking about future proofing your peace of mind. And this is where really we'll be going into a little bit um, of the challenges in terms of adoption of new technologies, adoption of these new paradigms, um, regardless almost of where you might be in your journey, whether you already are in the API landscape or if you're not, what could be a few considerations to keep in mind when you are um, looking for looking at adoption. Finally, a quick introduction to our uh, universal data graph, um, which would effectively solving some of these challenges that we'll be focusing on initially, and then a quick demonstration in terms of how you can, how, how the type universal data graph actually works with Tyke, how you can use um, our API management platform to uh, manage and secure your REST, GraphQL, and SOAP endpoints, and then eventually combine all of that into a single unified graph. So really exciting stuff. I am very excited to share this with you and um, let's keep going. Right, um, so in terms of the beginning of um, cross system communication, which is effectively what an API does. So APIs, application um, program interface, um, was typically used for inter system inter service communication. SOAP was definitely one of the early means or mechanisms of actually making this communication possible. SOAP stands for Simple Objects uh, Access Protocol. What that usually just really meant was it, it worked by making data available as services. At the end of the day, most um, the, the key thing that an API does is to make data available or in some cases making specific functions available. So that is, so SOAP, the way it worked was to make it available as web services. Um, it was highly standardized and it used XML primarily as the format in which it would um, receive requests and send out responses. There were a couple of pros and cons here. Um, the key pro here at this stage was that it was, it was language and platform agnostic, which was obviously very, very useful from the point of view of um, development to a certain extent, as well as um, building for different kinds of um, platforms. So that was, that was at the early days, this was quite, quite beneficial at that point of time. Then it had a few different security extensions, which again made sure that the, the communication that was happening was, was secure. And even if you did not have to build everything yourself, there were extensions available that you could hook onto to get to that level of to the level of security that you desired and finally it was verbose which meant that you could see a lot of the the raw payloads and then how it was constructed you could see in depth uh, in terms of how it actually worked the cons of course on the on the flip side was that a it was very very it was xml xml specific uh, in terms of the delivery of the messages or the reception of the the requests which made it a little bit rigid in terms of how you do it. Uh, it also made it a little bit heavyweight because you, because of that verbose nature of things, it also, um, the, the responses that you got back wasn't in, in, in any small format. It was definitely, it had a lot more of branches. It had a few more layers that you had to tackle to do that. 
And it wasn't an easy job to actually update the, the messages. If you had to change anything in the overall payload, you had to change the structure a little bit, it wasn't really a, a simple way of, of going about doing that. So with some of these concerns, then we went into the next shift in the way APIs were managed, which is probably the most popular one that exists at this point of time, and that would be REST. So REST stands for representational state transfer. Again, some of these full forms sometimes make sense. Sometimes it can, it's all right, it's there, it, it exists. Can be a bit technical at points. Uh, but really what it, what it did was it made data available as resources, as opposed to simple web services is what SOAP was managing to do. Uh, it is definitely the most commonly used means of communication between systems. Uh, and as pros, the, the key thing was that it, it managed to decouple the client and server side, which made it very, very flexible in terms of developing your, your applications quicker and, and faster. So compared to SOAP, again, it managed to um, support multiple formats. I think one of the more popular formats today is JSON, um, which if you, can, if you see, usually tends to be a lot lighter as compared to something like XML or, or the responses that you would get with, with SOAP. Um, in terms of cons, again, uh, there wasn't, there is no single rest structure, which can be a bit tricky sometimes in terms of the overall standardized nature of SOAP uh, in the early days. This was definitely flexible, but at the same time with that flexibility came, um, okay, what is the best way of developing this and best way of delivering this? Um, there wasn't extremely strict standards for that. So sometimes that could be, could have been a bit of a challenge in terms of handling it. In terms of payloads, again, not, not the lightest. You could still go a little bit over. You could get data being served to you, which, which, which could be higher on the, the overall payload scale um, as, as compared to, to something a bit more lighter. Um, and over the years, what also happened was REST tends to be very, very specific in terms of what you, what you require. Typically, as, as REST practices, that's what you would end up doing with REST that you have a singular endpoint and that endpoint is, is corresponding to a very specific type of request, which would then um, return a very specific kind of, of response. Um, and that again, but, but over the years where there was need for flexibility uh, and REST was the only way that you could, could manage it, the, the challenge there was you started getting into either the areas of cascading REST requests where you make one request and that was mul making multiple calls um, to, to different data sources to combine all of that information and, and present that to you. Um, and that made it susceptible to things like over or under fetching of information. Um, the flip side of, of making those cascading requests was to actually end up making these, these massive super API REST, point, uh, REST endpoints which would effectively give you a whole lot of information. And then you have to go ahead and, and filter out a lot of that data um, on the front end. And that again meant that there's either a lot of computation happening on the, on the front end side of things, or if you are making those cascading requests, there's a lot of things happening on, on the server side of things. So, so there was, there's always this little uh, gap in flexibility when it came to requirements, especially across omni-channel um, or, or omni-platform application development, which is what led to the advent of GraphQL. So GraphQL is basically a mechanism of querying the data that you need. Um, and this was born at, at, at Facebook. And a little history of that was, the reason why they did that was because they were looking at a mechanism for um, really getting the right kind of information getting the right kind of data available for multiple applications across multiple devices. Um, and that's where you could see, a, you could see REST showing a few cracks in that, uh, unless you were building very specifically for each of these devices, uh, each of these endpoints, which again is possible. Um, there wasn't a real easy way for you to um, just get or fetch the thing that you needed specific to, um, to your use case. And that's where GraphQL came in, where it was, it was very, very flexible. And it was really easy to make these, these queries, which would request exactly what you needed, even if the data that was being made available was, was larger, but your application could request exactly what it needed. That meant that the payload was a lot lighter 
um, the, the concept of over and under fetching was, was a lot lesser in terms of probability, not that it does not happen at all, but the, the probability was a lot lesser in terms of the need for doing that. Um, so obviously flexibility in terms of discoverability as well, it was um, GraphQL comes with its with, with almost what do you say automatic uh, documentation because the way you construct it requires you to create a schema up front and that schema almost gives you a form of documentation of its own which will which will let you know what you can or cannot do with your with your endpoints without the need for um, specially creating uh, documentation for it which you still can you can have your own extended documentation even around graphql endpoints but there is an autom automated way that at a baseline level definitely works for most, most uh, GraphQL schemas. And then of course it fits the graph-like data. So where GraphQL again thrives is again, trying to manage or trying to combine a lot of different data sources, which have these cascading styles to it, where you're looking, if you're familiar with, with a graph data format or the, or, or the way a graph data structure, then this is a really, really easy and good way of, of managing that, that graph that you have. In terms of whether it works really well with, with flat data structures, maybe, maybe not. You may not need GraphQL for that. Um, and I'm on the camp. So when it comes to consideration of some of these things, of course, you need to think about um, complexities and a lot of other things, which we will go into right after this. But um, it, GraphQL typically works better when it comes to the graph-like data structures. And then finally, the cons of it is knowledge. Um, in terms of getting started or, or getting started with GraphQL or building something out, you do need to understand the mechanisms and how GraphQL actually works. Uh, building out your own GraphQL server or building, creating those queries, there is a, a degree of knowledge or learning curve that you need to go through before you start adopting GraphQL. Um, there are a few caching complexities that come with it, uh, typically because you don't, you're not really working with a single singular endpoint anymore. You're working with, you're not working with different endpoints to cache different requests, but you're working with single endpoint with different queries. So you, you have to do that caching perhaps at that query level. Um, instead of the, the endpoint level, which typically you would see uh, with, with REST. And then performance, again, can be a little bit of a challenge where while you're looking at complexity being simplified through managing these, these graph-like data structures, performance-wise, it could be a bit of a challenge because you might be behind the scenes combining um, some of the few, a number of different data sources or data points from database and um, that could have an impact on performance. It's not a necessity, it doesn't happen all the time, but there is, again, a higher chance of, of doing that. On to next part. So as an organization, the biggest thing, biggest thing to, un to know is, look, large organizations probably started off in the early days, especially if you're a decade or so older, or maybe a couple of decades older in some cases, you may have started off at the early stages of API management, of, of API development, and SOAP might have been your starting point. But then over the years, you started moving into REST, and um, that's again happened to, to solve your requirements at that point of time. However, you still have that legacy code that is still there. And now to stay competitive uh, with your landscape, you want to start considering something like GraphQL for your cross application development, cross platform application development. Um, but how do you then shift all of that stack that you already have built and all of that debt that you have behind you and, and still move forward and adopt these, these newer technologies and, and make it uh, useful for your particular use case. And that's where I, th I think the peace of mind as an organization becomes a key thing. And there are a couple of challenges that come in terms of adoption um, of some of these or are moving into um, these, these newer technologies. The first thing, of course, is the cost of adoption. The cost of adoption, if you are an existing organization that has already worked, has, has these legacies, then you are, you're looking at migration, the resources that might be, avail that might be needed, the, the personnel, the, the time, and therefore the overall cost of it. That could be quite a huge blocker in terms of whether you you should be making that jump or do you just keep, do you stay where you are at this point of time? So that's a definite consideration. If you're a newer organization, then you have to sort of think about what is your use case 
and what is going to be fitting your specific needs. Um, a lot of times the conversations here tend to be, okay, SOAP is an old, old older system, REST came and replaced that. Um, and now GraphQL is going to be the new thing and that's going to replace REST. Um, and this might be a controversial opinion, but I'm on the camp where I say, I, I see REST and GraphQL potentially coexisting. Um, there might be under very specific use cases, both REST could be valuable for you to use. Maybe REST is the way for you to go or under specific use cases, GraphQL might be the way for you to go. Um, and again, there will be a multiple, a few different ways in which you might need to consider it, but a lot of it is gonna be driven by your specific use case. There is no flat answer saying GraphQL is the future and that is exactly what you should be using all the time. That is not really true. Um, and, and same goes with REST as well, that REST is simple, easy, flexible, let's just keep using that. Um, but in some cases that again may not be true for REST either. So, so I, I don't potentially see a specific winner in either one of the camp. Uh, yes, I, I feel like the switch from SOAP to one of these newer technologies might be a little bit easier to, to um, comprehend because there was a bit of a paradigm shift between SOAP and REST. Um, there was a, a much bigger jump as opposed to I think what there is at this point of time between REST and GraphQL. It's, it's, it's purely use case driven at this point of time, the choice of whether you go with REST or, or GraphQL. And, and knowledge base again becomes a, a big a big challenge in that as well, where you do need to have a good understanding of of um, what you're going to be using your your own technical stack, your own development um, developers that you've you've got available. What kind of resources do you have to play with, and that could also influence the way you choose or make a choice of, of in in this manner. So with these key challenges, let me introduce so. If you're talking about peace of mind and we're talking about future-proofing your organization, an ideal solution would be where you could, you don't have to make some of these migration choices where perhaps there could be a way where you can keep using your soap, you can keep securing your rest and keep experimenting with GraphQL and see which one fits better and adopt as you go. And that's where uh, type universal data graph comes in. What it does is that it combines multiple APIs into one single universal interface. It becomes a central integration point for all of your internal as well as external APIs, regardless of whether that is REST, GraphQL, or so. So you're almost not needing to make that choice if you're looking to simply experiment with um, and, and, and build out a product either for proof of concept or even build out production quality um, applications with the universal data graph without having to, to fundamentally change how your backend servers and systems are working at this point of time. This is the power of, graph, of, of universal data graph that we are bringing to the table. Uh, the little caveat with, with SOAP at this point is that we typically would convert SOAP into REST um, just so that we are we are at par in terms of the kind of payloads that we are working with and the kind of responses that we are working with, uh, as opposed to being very XML specific in terms of the approach. So that's the only caveat there. But having done that, you do have that mechanism already available as a no code mechanism within Tyke as well, where you can convert SOAP to REST and then combine all of that together to build your universal data graph exposed as a GraphQL endpoint. So uh, that's a fair amount of talk already. I think uh, I'm gonna go straight into the demonstration and um, let me stop sharing here. And um, all right. So I am currently on my type dashboard and I am gonna be, so I'm gonna be doing a couple of different things here. So I'm gonna start off with a REST endpoint and I'm gonna add that to my Dyke um, gateway. I am going to use, I'm gonna be using a graph, existing GraphQL endpoint and securing that. And I'm gonna be using a SOAP web service and I'm gonna be transforming that into REST. And then finally, I'm gonna be combining all of that using the universal data graph. For those unfamiliar with an API management platform, it is basically, as the name suggests, it's, it's a mechanism for managing your APIs. It, it can 
greatly boosts the way you build it, making it a lot more efficient. It can take care of things like your security. It can take care of things like rate limiting, your quotas of requests, versioning. So a whole range of things that are made available to really ease out the means by which you are developing and managing your APIs um, for your end users. So let's go, let's get straight into it. Um, under APIs, I am quickly going to create a new API. And the API that I'm going to be using is this API called um, JSON placeholder typecode. And this is this is a publicly available uh, endpoint that you can use for, for testing. And I'm just using that for demonstration. And I'm going to be using something specific called the users. So as you can see, what it does is it re returns the a list of users uh, for you with specific information with it. So that's at the basic level, that's what it is. So I'm just going to take that. I'm going to give it a name, let's say type code users. And I'm going to change the target URL and figure. For now, I'm going to just remove my authentication just so that I can test it out. And I'm going to save that. Heading back, you'll see right at the top, you'll have your API URL. I'm going to copy that. I'm using Postman. And if I were to make that request now through that URL, you'll see that I get a whole list of users uh, made available directly to me. So that's what this is essentially mounting your REST endpoint using the Tykes uh, gateway, API gateway. I can also go more specific and request for a very specific user. I can do that as well. This is going to give me user number one and information specific to that. So I'm going to keep it to users. Now, obviously, this, is, this doesn't show what is special so far. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is add a security layer to it. Because as you can see, um, this is an open API. And in, maybe your use case means that you keep it public. But if you were to then secure this so that only specific people with um, access get to use or, or view this information, then you can do that as well. So a couple of steps here. First one is to change my authentication mode to authentication token. I'm going to update this. And the way you build out these authentication token is that you need uh, a key for authorization. And um, what that would do is then the way you do it, of course, is if you've got a, you can you can hand, handle that on a per API basis. You create a key for each individual API. However, that could get tedious. It could be quite cumbersome to manage over a period of time if you've got multiple APIs to manage. So what we do is instead is have having the concept of policies. And what policies do is they are essentially these, these overarching rules of engagement that you can uh, describe or define um, that would take into account security. And it can do a few other things like rate limiting and quotas as well, which we may not be touching today. So I'm going to add a policy using my type code users. I'm going to go into configuration and give, give it a name. I'm just going to call it users. And I'm going to keep an expiration of six hours. So my policy has been created. So this is going to, again, the, the global rules of creation of your, your, your keys. So whether you have one or 100, if your um, requirements around security and, and rate limiting and, and uh, management is, is same for, say, 100 APIs, you can simply create one policy and that will enable you to generate a key for all of them. So that makes it a lot easier to manage. So I'm going to go in and add a key using my user's policy. And so what this will do is it will import all of those um, specific security requirements, in this case being authorization token, into this policy directly. I don't need to configure anything, and it's going to create me this key. So now that my authentication me mechanism has changed, if I were to try and make a request, it's going to throw me an error saying that you know your authorization field is missing. So I'm going to add my authorization field here in my header and use the key that I just generated. And now I will get back my payload. And this is essentially working um, in, a, in a secure format now instead of being publicly open and available. 
So that at the basic level is your REST, securing your REST endpoint, existing REST endpoint. Now let's move on to our GraphQL endpoints. And let me add a new one. The endpoint that I'm going to be using is called the, the Trevor Blades country. Um, the country's Trevor Blades endpoint, and this is essentially a list of different countries, continents, and associated information that you can get. I'm just going to call it countries info and configure it. Once again, I'm just going to disable authentication to begin with, just so that we can test it out. And you'll see here that it automatically imports the schema. Again, if you're familiar with GraphQL, this is essentially the blueprint of your um, endpoint, the kind of kind of call, the kind of request that you can make, the kind of queries, which is the, the, the term in GraphQL that you can make is, is specified within your, your schema. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test this out. And the way to do that is there is this option of enabling an external playground. I'm just going to check that and update it. Copy and paste it here. Sorry, I need to say playground. So this is an interface where you can make your queries uh, in GraphQL. And I'm going to make, so obviously if I start, there is an autocomplete feature here which will tell me what are my options that are available. And um, code, I'm going to give it SG and then Singapore. And what I need is the name of my country. I want, um, let's say what the capital is. And well, Singapore is Singapore, that's fine. And I would want an emoji. So now, of course, there is, there's an autocomplete format here, but the other way you can also look at it is the schema on the right-hand side, and you'll see what kind of information is available. So if I look at country, I can see that I have code available, name available, phone, continent, capital, currency, all of the information is available to me in terms of the, 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 what, what I can actually query and, and get back. So this is, this is a typical format of that query. I am going to make it, and I get my response back. So of course the capital is this, I can change my country code to let's say US for instance, and that's gonna give me US specific information. And um, if I actually want to change my query to say, give me all of my countries, then it is capable of doing that as well. And again, as you can see, it is requesting very specific information, even though all of this information, all of these fields are made available I can request very specific information that I need, and it will only respond back with that. And at any point of time, if I if I did need something more, for instance, perhaps I need um, the currency information, then I can add that, and it will include that in the payload automatically as well. So that's kind of the power of flexibility that, that GraphQL brings to the table. Now, we'll do the same as we did with REST and secure this information. Um, so same mechanism, I'm going to change my authentication mode to authentication token and update this. I'm going to create a policy. Call it, so countries info, configure this and say countries. My policy has been created. Into my keys, I'm going to add one using my countries again and it'll create something for me. So now if I were to go back to my playground and try to make that request, it is going to throw me an error because you know this is this is not what it is. Um, in this case I already had an authentication header in here. So if I were to change if I just remove this and change this. Sorry, this is not my playground. That's why it's giving me that. Yeah, this playground. So right now I do not have an authentication token here. So it is going to give me authorization field missing. So the way to do that is to add this into my header. And add my key into it. And if I now make that request, 
it will give me back my response. Once again, we have secured our endpoint, secured our query based on the authentication token and now only specific users with permission will be able to access this information. So that's that, that is again. So there are, there are definitely other things that you can do. We do have things like query depth limiting, field restrictions, all of that is available. I'm not gonna go into the details of that yet unless you have specific questions around that. We do run other webinars that go into the depths of each one of them for both REST specifically and GraphQL specifically. I just wanted to show you how you can um, secure your existing endpoints with this. Now move in, let's move into something a bit more exciting, uh, which is how do you now handle SOAP? Going back in time into your legacy and how do we do that? So again, if you're familiar with SOAP, the way it was developed is something with something called WSDL, which I think is a web service language, development language or something like that. I think that's what the full form was. So that is what you need in order to, to create these, to, to use your, your SOAP. We are gonna be using an existing web service, SOAP web service, which is gonna be this called the number conversion. Um, it has a couple of them, number two words and number two dollars. We are gonna be using number two words. And what it does, as the name suggests, is that you type in a number and it will give you the, 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 the word format of that uh, number. So let's see how that's gonna look like. I'm gonna go back here. And the way you do it is we're gonna be using the import function. So import your API and you see this option here called from WSDL or WSDL as it is usually typically referred to. You click on that and it'll give you a few different options. So let's start with the, the target URL, similar to how REST and GraphQL worked. I'm gonna use this. And then finally, what it requires is the XML, that is the service description that comes with it. So I'm gonna copy the entire thing here and just add that information. So now if I hit generate API, it will automatically create this number conversion um, endpoint for us. Now let's go inside and see what all it has done for us. And if you see here again, authentication mode is open, which is fine, let's keep it that way. What we will do right now is to transform this into a REST endpoint. And the way we will do that is by going into the endpoint designer. We're gonna be using plugins to do this. One thing before we do that is, as you can see, these endpoints that are available, there are two endpoints that are made available are based on the services. So one for each, one for number two words and one for a number two dollars. We are gonna be using number two words. So I'm going to be using that example specifically. And if you see here, the number to number conversion appears twice in that path, which may or may not be desirable. Uh, in my case, it is not desirable. So I'm just gonna get rid of that and I can do that through my relative path. And as soon as I remove it, you can see that it's just number conversion and number two words. Small thing, but useful. Now, what I'm gonna be using as a plugin right now is I'm gonna be using two plugins. One is gonna be the body transform. And the second one is going to be modify headers. I'm gonna be using each one of them in just a bit. First, let's go into body transform. So what we want to do here is that we're gonna be using a template of request. And that template is gonna be available here. So if I go into this, so this is kind of form of, of its own documentation of the service. And you will see that there is a request mechanism that you have, the, the request payload here. And I'm gonna copy that and paste it here. So if I just go to, if I just look into this so that you're not confused, the, the structure of this is there is, there is an overarching envelope or envelope body, there is a number two words, and then this here, the UB num is the part where things essentially change. This is where you send in the information, the, the number that is, and you will get back a response. So I'm gonna change that because I want this to be dynamic as opposed to hard coded. And I'm gonna be using go template um, specifically for this. So just, just follow along. I've got this and I'm gonna say number to convert. And this could be any, any variable. This is essentially a variable name in go so that it, is an, it, it takes in an input 
through my request and it spits out the right response as opposed to hard coding and information here. If you had to test this out, I can quickly send the JSON payload here and let's say number to convert is 35. And if I test it, you'll see that my output or the, the, the request that is gonna go in is no longer ubnum string or anything like that. It's actually dynamically changing to 35, if you can see that. So, and if I were to change this to say 25, then that also changes accordingly. So that's that's the dynamic nature of how this is gonna work. Now let's go on to the next one, which is response. And here what we want is to retrieve the right information and, and get it back, right? So in order to do that, the way I'm gonna be using this here is I'm gonna say, I'm defining my response body. So this is gonna be, uh, I'm gonna call it converted. So this is essentially the variable that is gonna get back the response. And I am going to use this. Uh, okay, I could copy paste this, but I'm not. I'm going to show you how this is gonna work because we are using a template again. This is a string within the curly double curly brackets. What I want to do is to go into the entire branch. So if I look at my response here, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. You would see the way the response comes in is envelope, body, number two words response, and then finally number two word result. This is where the response is gonna come in. So that's how you need to construct the way it works. So, the way it's gonna work, I'm just gonna take this here, is you go envelope, body, number two words response, number two words result. And this is gonna get me back my, my response, right? Okay, so that's one. And the next part is we need to change the headers because we need to tell the system, the service, the the content type in which we are gonna be sending this information. So on the request side, the format in which we are sending this is XML. So we're just gonna specify that and add it. And on the response side, we want to get it back in terms of JSON. So here content type is gonna be application JSON. I'm gonna update this and that is my endpoint. So if everything goes well now, uh, we should be able to make use of this. So I'm gonna go back to my Postman. I hope you can see my screen. And I am gonna copy my endpoint. So that endpoint alone isn't gonna be enough. I need to say, I think it is number two words, so number two words right here. And I need to send in a payload is going to be number to convert, um, let's say 35. And if everything goes well, uh, I think I did something wrong here, number conversion, did I do something wrong? Okay, let's do this. Um, Sorry, I see something in the chat, post type, yep. Okay, so this, if I work it out this way, I think this is the response that you would get. Yep, so that's how your response post here works 35. Uh, thank you for that, Torov. Um, if I change it into 45, it'll get me back my response as well. So there you go, simple. Um, we've now converted our SOAP into a REST service and uh, that's how it works. On to the final part. So now that we've seen how existing SOAP, REST and GraphQL endpoints would work, we now move into 
main event, which is our um, universal data graph. So let's now try and combine this into a single graph. How can we do that? I'm going to go in and say combined data. I'm going to be using, because I'm not proxying an existing GraphQL service, it's going to be true universal data graph. So let's go and configure this now. Once again, I'm going to just get rid of the authentication mechanism for now and save it. Back in. And I'm going to start with my schema. So it starts off with the mutation and query. I'm not going to go into mutations yet. Um, not, 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 in, not in this particular webinar, but if you're curious, let me know. We can touch upon that later on as well. I'm going to start with defining my types. So in schemas, you kind of look at what are your different objects that are going to be um, returned or the objects that you're going to be working with. So my first object type is going to be user. So the, the example that I'm going to be using now is our, you know, the, the, the type of code user endpoint that we used. So I'm going to be getting this from REST, this REST endpoint, and importing that as a, a GraphQL schema. So let's do that. Here, the information that I want, so what, is, what information is available to me? I've got a whole bunch of it. I'm not going to use all of them. I'm simply going to be using the ID, name, and email for the time being. So let's talk about ID and ID here. Then I've got my name, which is going to be of type string. And I'm going to have email, which is also going to be of type string. Now, what I also want with this is that when I make the query, I think I'll go into that once the query comes. I wouldn't want to confuse you. The second user type, the second type is going to be, actually, let's start with this. I think that will be easier instead of trying to combine everything. Let's do this. So let's do get user as a query. And the type it I wanted to get back is user. But I'm going to be requesting for a very specific kind of user. And the way you do that here is if you go into users, this endpoint, you do a slash one, you would have your um, specific user information coming in. And that's kind of what I want to query. So in order to do that, I'm going to add in a parameter or an argument in this case, which is going to be my ID, type ID. So based on this ID input, I will return the information of that specific user. So now if I have this, I'm going to go into my data source with just this information. And I've got my get user. So I need to define a data source. I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to go into my data source and define it. It's going to be of type rest. And I'm going to use this trade-off. But as you can imagine, what's going to happen here is that this is going to be, again, hard-coded to just use a type 1, which is not something that we want. We want this to be dynamic. And in order to make that dynamic, I'm going to take away the 1. And once again, we're going to be using our template, which is going to be dot arguments dot id so arguments again the 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 little bracket information that you would be sending in alongside your query this is how you would access it through arguments and the, the one that we're going to be saying sending based on our schema is is id and based on that id we'll be retrieving information so i'm just going to update this field update here. Okay, let's see. I'm going to construct a query. Um, in this case, it is going to be get user type. Um, okay, I wanted to have ID number one. Give me back my ID, give me back a name and give me my email. Yeah, okay, I think there is something off here. Um, so this is not gonna work yet. Let me get into my schema once again and just make sure, right, so it did not take my argument. So let me do ID once again and ID 
Let's update this. Go back into my data source. And here, I'll be able to see my data source has been mapped. Go into Playground. When I make this request, it gives me this information. This for the first user. I can change it to the second, and it'll give me a second information. So this is kind of our internal playground, and we can use that as well, as opposed to the external playground, depending on the use case, whether you're building it, are you doing it during test, or you're making it available, exposing this to external people, you can use either one of them. So that's how now we've essentially what we've done is used one REST endpoint and combine this into, um, and then and, and transform that into a GraphQL um, schema. What we can do further now, what I'm going to do now is we created that SOAP endpoint and SOAP to REST endpoint. And that is essentially a converter. So what I'm going to do, again, this, is, this may or may not be useful, but this is more for demonstration purpose. What I'm going to try and do is to just convert that ID that I'm getting from this number format into, uh, into, into a word format, essentially. So that's going to be my conversion here. So in order for me to do that, I'm just going to say type converter. And I'm just going to say converted string. This is my type. This is where my payload is going to come in. And just a, just a thing to remember that this converted field should ideally map to how you have made your soap to rest transformation. So because we use converted there, this makes, makes a lot of sense. What we're going to do is we're going to add that to our user and say, um converted id will be of type convert i'm hoping i'm getting my spelling correct yeah and i'm gonna update this and if i go back into my data source now what i need to do is to map this specific data source and define the data source here i'm going to be using rest and I'm going to be using the endpoint that we were using previously here. So this endpoint directly, because now it is REST. If it's post and it needs a body. And the body here is going to be um, my Number to convert. Uh, to, 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 to. If you remember from our previous um, example, this was basically number to convert. And I am just going to be using, again, it needs to be dynamic. So we need object dot id so in this case we are using object because it is within the object user and we are using a specific field within that specific object as opposed to when we were doing it at this level at the query level where it was on it was an argument that was coming through so that's the slight difference there um but this should again work dynamically so i am just going to update this field And update things here. And hopefully, if everything is fine, I'm just going to check everything is fine here. Converted is OK. The source is OK. If I were to now go into adding my converted ID, and it's going to tell me converted. It should return my response here as two. So, and if I change it to one, it'll do that as well. So, what we've done here again is we've taken a REST endpoint, we've taken a soap to REST endpoint, and we have combined all of that through into this, this GraphQL schema. We can take it a step further as well. If you want to add another source of REST in here, we can do that as well. And the example that I'm going to be using. Here is a to do's uh, extension for the users. So again, back into my schema. So each user can also have a to do associated with it. Once again, I'm going to define my type is going to be to do. 
um, todos have an ID of type ID. They have a title, string, and they have a status called completed. And I am gonna take that of type to do. Now the difference here is gonna be that it is essentially gonna be an array of information. So the way you denote that is by those square brackets. So once again, I'm just gonna update this, go into my data sources, and I need to map the data source here. So this is gonna be a little bit similar to how we did the very first one. Um, once again, instead of using arguments ID, I'm gonna be using object ID because it is at the user level and not the query level. And the, the structure in which it works is that you just go, once you get the user ID, you just slash to do's will return your response there. So I'm just gonna update this field and update. So now again, if everything goes well, I can add in my to do's with say the title and the status. And this should give me back all this information. So right here, we are essentially combining um, two REST endpoints and a SOAP to REST endpoint and creating this universal data graph um, and exposing that as a GraphQL scheme for you. So there you go, your past, present, future of your APIs, whether that is SOAP, REST or GraphQL is all secured, all managed um, through Tyke and combined into a single endpoint using Tyke's universal data graph. So I hope this was this was useful. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now. That's the end of my demonstration, and I would like to take questions now. So that I think we've gone on a fair amount. I think we've got ten, five, ten minutes more left. So I'm just going to quickly stop sharing and see if there are any questions that would come in. So yeah, feel free if you've got any questions. Let me see. Okay. What are the specific um, what are the specific things you can do in terms of restriction of access to GraphQL endpoints or GraphQL queries? Okay, fair question. Um, let's go into that one. So as you can imagine with GraphQL, which is a little, being a little bit different from REST is that with REST, you've got endpoint, you do everything almost at the endpoint level. But with GraphQL, you have usually have one endpoint and then everything is usually handled at that query level. So what could potentially go wrong here? Let's talk about that. What could potentially go wrong is that you can combine a different few different layers or a few different levels um, of information. And, and what does that mean? Okay, let me, let me actually showcase this. I'm gonna go back to sharing mode. And if you remember our endpoint, which was our country's endpoint. We have our country's info here. And if we were to go back into our playground, I could make a few different kinds of queries here. So obviously we can start off simple with my country and it's code associated with it. Um, could be SG and I can go with my name and um, currency and uh, emoji and all of that. And this would give me a response. Uh, okay, I don't have an authorization field. So let me actually just get me, let me try and just create a quick policy here. I'm just going to get rid of this uh, or create a key based on this policy. So if I were to just add my authorization. Give me back my response. There we go. 
But if you look at the schema, there, there are a few different things that you can nest in there. And one of which is continents. So what I can do now is I can go into continent and start adding information here. It could be a continent name. So right now it's giving me this, but I can also, in addition to continent, the continents can also have countries. So I can still go into my countries and go into name and currency again. And this will give me all of the names and currencies of each of the countries within that continent. And once again, I can do, I can keep doing this again, where I can go back and within the countries again, country could have continent, which could again have a name and could, and that could again give me more information. I can keep doing that because there is no restriction at this point of time. And the, the deeper that you keep going, the, the more processing is going to be needed for the, the backend server. And that could really, if you go to, to an infinite number of the depth, then that could be that could be either a malicious because of a malicious attack or because of like bad queries coming through. So there is a way to actually restrict this where you can restrict the depth limit of this query. And in order to do that, you just go back into your policy. And if you look at it here, you would see something called query depth limit. So right now it is set to unlimited. If I uncheck it and make it three. So the way you look at query depths, usually as, as a cheat mechanism, you just look at the number of open curly braces. So you've got your one, two, three, four, and five. So I think at this point of time, we're at, at the depth level of five, um, but we only want it to be up to say three. So we want to get into say country and we want to get the continent and that, that should be the end of it. So we're gonna keep it to three and update this. Now what should happen is it's gonna restrict me and say depth limit has been exceeded. So it will not allow me to make that many queries or go to that level. So it is a mechanism to obviously preventing malicious attacks um, what I can do now is if I were to remove this, I think there's going to be two of them removed, I should now get back my information because this is my allowed limit. If I were to add any other level to this, um, it is going to restrict. I can obviously make it a lot more, 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 I can make it stricter or I can open it up a little bit more if I want to go further down a few more levels. So yeah, so that, that's something that you've got available to you. The other thing that you also have specifically available is field-based permissions. And that comes in when you go into your specific APIs. So you have this here, which is called field-based permission. And this comes in if you are looking to restrict access on specific queries or specific types of information that you want, to, want people to access or not access in this case. So what I can do is right now I've got my, my country. Um, if I want people not to look at say the currency, which I'm using right now, I can restrict it. Or even at a query level, if I don't want people to know about say the continent information, I can simply uncheck it and update it. And if I go back here, it's gonna tell me that field is restricted. So because I've got continent information here, I cannot make use of it. If, once I get rid of this, then I get back my information. So yeah, so those are like the very specific GraphQL based uh, restrictions that we have in place or, or policies that you can set in order to manage those um, queries a lot, lot better. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Um, so Gaurav asks us, um, can we develop GraphQL without Tyke? Absolutely. So Tyke isn't a mechanism for you to build GraphQL. I think there are a few different means in which you can build out your, your GraphQL endpoints. Um, I, think, I think Apollo is one of the ways in which you, be, it's, it's one of the popular ones at this point of time. You can build your own server as well if you want, which I personally did as well in order to test it out. But what I would say is if you're using, if, you, if you're making transformations, if you're on REST and you're trying to make a transformation into GraphQL, then I think that the time for you to convert all of those services into, into GraphQL would be a lot longer if you're doing it bespoke on, and on your own. Of course, it give, comes with a lot of flexibility, a lot of control, but at the same time, it also means you need to add in a lot more resources to do that, which GraphQL with, with universal data graph, it makes it a little bit easier. But even otherwise, even if you were to develop your own GraphQL endpoints, like, a, like we saw before, you can use 
uh, type to essentially um, secure and manage those existing GraphQL endpoints as well. So, so yeah, there is no need for you to be uh, developing um, GraphQL endpoints using Tyke, but just know that there is a mechanism in which you can transform your existing endpoints into this. Again, the idea is to make the, the, the migration or adoption of, of newer technologies a lot easier. If that is your need, you don't have to keep hesitating that, oh, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take a lot of resources for us to understand, make this happen. Um, with UDG, you, as you saw, there was no real code involved in order for you to do that. We are, we are taking care of a lot of those middleware uh, aspects directly into, um, in, into the, the API management layer. So I hope I managed to answer that question, Gaurav. Um, if you have anything more specific, do let me know as well. Thanks for your question. Okay, um, I'm gonna give it another minute in case anybody else has any other specific questions. Um, otherwise, I would say thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it was really exciting, I think, to bring together almost the, the three different worlds of APIs and see how they can sort of function together. Of course, the example that I used was slightly on the simplistic side. Um, I, would, I would implore you to, to try, uh, encourage you to actually try it out uh, for yourself and uh, take your own use cases, take your own projects into consideration. And if you come up with something interesting, do let us know. We'll be very happy to talk to you about this. Um, at the heart of it, our API management essentially is comprised, the Tyke API management is comprised of a, our gateway, our dashboard, and a developer portal. The gateway itself is open source, so you don't actually need to pay anything at all for you to get started. You can use our open source gateway to um, manage all of these things or to essentially build out your own universal data graph. All of that is readily available to you. At no cost, we want to experiment. We are, we are very big on open source ourselves. So yeah, I will implore you to try that out and, and definitely share your stories with us. If you get stuck, if you have any questions, do feel free to reach out to us as well. We'll be very, very happy to, to talk to you. Um, we are developers, engineers at, the, at, at our hearts. So we are usually very, very excited in terms of um, newer use cases or, or ways in which people are, are using or engaging with our product. So with that, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Until next time.